Hey, I'm Alex. I'm Finn. And we're going to talk about a few uh, recent releases, or kind of recent because we fall out of schedule, but whatever. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, um, as every week, since we're going to try to do this every week, so first of all, um, a blockbuster. So here, obviously, we've taken um, Justice League, which came a few weeks ago, but we're going to come now to review. And um, as a second film, uh, we've chosen to talk about a more artistic pick, and that is um, A Killing of a Sacred Deer by Yorgos Lanthimos, so a Greek director, which will kind of contextualize. Um, so, yeah, let's start with uh, Justice League. But just before that, um, kind of uh, talk about the kind of problems that the DC universe has had to kind of set up their universe and kind of prompt popular responses because there's been a lot of hiccups with each one of the film, like Batman, the Superman, uh, Suicide Quad, Wonder Woman a bit better. So, yeah, what did you think leading on to Justice League of kind of the DC universe? Uh, yeah, well, I thought uh, Justice League did sort of mirror all of the problems with the DC universe. And those, uh, it's, I think you summed it up the other day quite nicely. It's got this real identity crisis mm. coming between the success of Nolan's uh, Dark Knight franchise, the serious tones of that, moving on to the more uh, comical and bright but majorly successful uh, uh, Marvel universe. Yeah, moment. and I think the film is, um, like, th this kind of run of, of the DCU films, I've kind of been almost stuck between, yeah, so The Dark Knight, and then just after that, DC made the weird uh, decision to um, release Green Lantern. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. With Ryan Reynolds in the CGI suit, no. which was, yeah, completely terrible, and was completely out of tone with The Dark Knight, and it does seem that a lot of these films have kind of the problems um, stick in between. And I also think, of course, that the original project had a lot of problems at first because obviously, seeing um, regarding Marvel's success, um, they really wanted to kind of quickly kind of produce and this yeah, universe yeah. and kind of, yeah, exactly emulate the success. And that goes into what happened at the beginning of Justice League. Yeah. There was this, mo there was this first 30 minutes where they're trying to introduce... Um, four or five yeah. characters where the Marvel Universe had about, I don't know, six, seven films to do that. And they were trying to squash it to the first 30 minutes of their movie, um, which just sort of didn't... Felt, uh, felt really rushed, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and so, so basically in Justice League, I mean, you kind of know the lineup. I mean, we've already kind of met... Um, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Right, yeah, but then you got the and then we've got three. And, we've got and, um, and Superman, Batman. which obviously is gone for this film, although sport. I mean, you can't kill a superhero. He, 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 he's gone for at the beginning of the film. We kind of continue with Batman with Superman left off, and so the film has to introduce his Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg, three characters which we've never seen before in the series in the space of thirty minutes. And mind you, like the the film is actually not as long as most other superhero no, movies. That it's only was. about five minutes over two hours. I think the official running time is two hours and ten minutes c credits included. So the beginning does feel um, very rushed. And Definitely. so I'm I'm just gonna start on on one um, elements that we kind of talked about just before, which is kind of the acting and the dialogue. And I know oh, you man. hated the dialogue and the attempts at more humour. Yeah, no, the whole thing, the whole way through. And I couldn't tell because, surprisingly, it was, we no noticed just before filming this, it was written by Joss Whedon, who wrote Avengers um, and a few other of the Marvel films. So I was quite surprised to see that he'd come up with one other person, all this terrible dialogue. Um, so I wonder if it was the dialogue that was terrible or if it was just the pacing of the editing along with the acting, which was pretty below par, I thought. Um, I feel, I mean, I think that for, from what I've heard, this problem has had probably the same problem as a lot of DC, of these DC movies has had before. I mean, it was the case for um, Batman vs Superman and Suicide Squad. Basically what they've done, I think, is done tons of reshoots after uh, course, because they found that there was not enough humor in the film. And so what we have, I think, is very similar to um, Batman vs Superman, we didn't have as much humour, but especially Suicide Squad, where the film is really caught between kind of these two tones, where you have these moments where these characters, where everything, uh, the film looks like it's taking itself really super seriously, and you have countless shots of these characters kind of looking fierce, yeah, and looking and this at, dark ride, yeah, yeah and this really kind of, I have to say, really cheesy dialogue a lot of the time, where it's like, you know, these kind of punchlines were... For example, there's this ad really early in the film, this is not a spoiler, where one, the Wonder Woman is kind of saving the day in this robbery, 
and the guy is like, oh, I don't believe, it's like, oh, can you believe in this world? And then Wonder Man comes along, it's like, I'm a believer. Yeah, and There's yeah, a few exactly times in, in the film, it's yeah, kind of yeah. catchy, kind no, of... there's so many of those. Um, so many really, of those. like, kind of ominous. And then there was just, like, random points where it's supposed being on Dark... Because Mar- one of the, the great things about Marvel is how well they inject the humour yeah, into sure. it while maintaining serious undertones. But this whole movie, which is the, the, pay- the timing of the humour was so um, off that it just completely uh, counteracted the, hu- like the seriousness of the film and just put it in a really stupid place. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I didn't hate it that much. And I did feel that um, the, 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 there were funny bits by the uh, Flash was played by Ezra Miller. And I did find that some... The problem is I did find that some... Um, Kind of so skits and silver, some quick, sentences. Just a quick silver copy. Okay, yeah, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll touch that in, in, in a tiny bit because I was going to come on the action and the whole CGI and stuff. But I did feel that there were some comical elements that didn't work within the film. The problem is those elements felt really kind of out of place and as if the kind of movie had suddenly shifted to a parody of itself. That's not at all kind of continuous in the movie structure. But so we have kind of yeah divided elements on that uh, kind of divided opinions on that point. But now okay, so I want to talk about the second part of the film. I feel that that sparked out of discussion and especially in regard to the previous kind of DC universe situations, which is the action and the heavy CGI yeah, based yeah, approach. Sure. The, the so what, well, how did aesthetic. you think? How did you think the action scenes and the action and the CGI looked yeah, in the I film? Thought the CGI was so overdone. It was so overproduced that it came across looking like <clears throat> with a sort of video game cutscene aesthetic um, rather than sort of what special effects and CGI are there for is to create um, a believable, unbelievable world yeah, that sure. you can be immersed in rather than just looking like the cutscene to the DC video game or whatever. So I mean, I, 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 I definitely agree with you. I felt um, actually a lot of people hated the, the kind of series from Man of Steel on and surprisingly, I actually really liked the action sequences of Man of Steel, although it was heavy CGI, because in a way there was still kind of a sense of scale. And obviously the kind of the, the, the question of how much action actually occupies the film is a different question. But I did feel that the action, over, although it was over the top, did have a sense of scale and of kind of movement, and you feel that everything had way to it. Mm. And I feel one of the problems I've actually had increasingly with those DC mun- universe and the action in it is the amount of time they actually spent on pulling slow motion shots and yeah, it was kind of a heavy stylized. Like, well, I was trying to catch her sword in that in the recent one, and yeah, yeah, no, 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 exactly. And it really did feel like the these kind of the, the problem with having so much like um, slow motion, and it, it it does kind of reduce that sense of scale. And obviously, the thing I liked with um, Man of Steel, but that kind of was um, had a, a lot of side effects in the rest of these films. Is obviously the the scale, the 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 the, the kind of. Um, DC aesthetic they've done now is really just like over the top every time and more destruction more destruction oh let's yeah, have like let's have a tower now tower. and yeah, let's have yeah, yeah, two yeah, towers yeah. now destroyed the problem is I, although I did feel that it can be very impressive to watch the problem is it kind of puts them in a dead end because every time there's like well, what can be done from now? We've always, I mean, in the first film, Man of Steel, they've already basically destroyed the whole world. Yeah, no, literally. And the problem yeah. with now with each of these iterations is it kind of feels now that everything, we've already kind of seen everything before when the thing is that the world so, so, so much been destroyed. And, okay, this is another thing, which I felt in, in the last one that Man of Superman completely uh, counter, like, counteracted the purpose and the message of the film. And I feel that it comes back here is the fact that it, it, I, I thought one of the more clever things of Batman and Superman, which obviously was very divisive, is the film kind of starts with, you know, the, we, see, we see the fight at the beginning of Man of Steel, so the first Superman film. So, you know, we see them from Batman's, from a human scale. Yeah, yeah. So the, this kind of discussion about the weight of things and how the battles between these two kind of superheroes affect the normal world and normal people in a way that I thought was kind of clever because it hadn't so much been um, kind of explored in other movies. The problem is, at the end of that film, like at the problem with here, we basically have them just destroying more things because at the end of that film, there was that completely out of place doomsday sequence which just pops up at the end of the film. And yeah, 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 just to introduce Wonder Woman for the rest of the franchise. Yeah, exactly. And although Batman, at the, the whole of the whole of that film, had been complaining about how Superman just is dangerous because he can destroy so much stuff, they had just ended up destroying the whole of that <laughs> silly fight in doomsday which made kind of no sense. And... I do feel that the movie kind of here kind of 
Although, although I thought... How shit was that the villain, though? How bad was the villain? I felt yeah. like I did not care about the villain in any shape or form. No, yeah, I think... It was, a, yeah, it was just terrible. I mean, I, th- I do feel, yeah, the villain was kind of a another kind of CGI uber man well, he, yeah, with no, no sort of really there was personality. There no real threat because he, we didn't care about him. We did, it was so two-dimensional that there was, no, there was no investment in him as a villain, which sounds stupid, maybe, but like so the best villain, there's many sides to them and that you're curious about them, um, and that helps you to invest in the story. Whereas if it's just a villain... Who's sort of just constantly saying cliche villain things? Yeah, he did you say know, a lot of cliche villain so things. Really much. You know how the movie's going to end, um, and it ended how mm. I thought it was going to. And uh, I've, and so again, similarly to because I feel that there's a lot of the problems in these films that it's kind of you know kind of instead of being fixed, have kind of ran top until this film, and this film does have actually sort of a collection of the best of of many of the problems. I mean, you know, we talked about the pace, the villain in this. I mean. The, the problem with this bin is, again, like, you, you want to kind of have some sort of comprehensible motive, not for an acceptable motive, for yeah, this guy yeah, want to destroy yeah, anything, yeah, yeah. but a comprehensible, a comprehensible motive. And the problem here is we have, again, kind of a, like a nominous, age-old threat, or basically... We've seen just, it for a million times. Before. He just wants to destroy everything for the sake of destroying with anything. Massive, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the word. What's the word? <laughs> Shit. Is Ruby behind the camera going to help <laughs> us? Um, a massive expositional cut yeah, scene oh, where it, goes, it just shows us the age old battle where him and his species were wiped out and now they're coming back from the. Okay, there was one thing though, I have to say about these action sequences, which I, again it's kind of a two way thing because on one side, um, I feel that, that that look that we're kind of going to for kind of this over the top mythological kind of apostolic. Um, kind of look, whatever, the lighting is very exaggerated and everything is over luminous and it kind of actually kind of looks off. Um, I think it's a, it's a DC um, um, draw called Alex Ross who did a few um, actually DC comics, one of the most famous ones called Kingdom Come. Anyway, who, uh, some, some guy on YouTube kind of compared his style um, to what DC are kind of trying to do and I do get the similarity where it's kind of like they were kind of filmed as if it were godlikes and kind of um, you know, taken from mythological yeah, giants, yeah. etc. And I do kind of see what they're going for it. But again, the, the, the problem with that is it kind of takes any sense of weight from the narrative and any sense of impact. And it's kind of like, oh, exactly, this is a cool kind of, these are cool visuals and a cool cutscene for a trailer yeah. or, you know, for, yeah, for video game cutscene, but makes a good trailer. doesn't kind of, doesn't really immerse you in the action. No. So, anyway, to conclude, because yeah. we talk about a lot, um, would you say, um, Justice League is worth it. I'd say it's worth it if you go watch with some friends knowing it's going to be shit and you'll have a laugh. Okay, so I would agree. I would just say, because I saw it in the IMAX, where I think kind of helped with the whole spectacular extravaganza of it. You saw it at a normal kind of screen. Quite a small screen. Um, so I would say if you can, I mean, it's a lot of money, but if you can... Um, Definitely try to, to, to go to the biggest screen you can in okay. IMAX, although it's expensive. But. Cool. All right. So we're so, talking next about uh, Yorgos Lanthimos' latest film, Killing of a Sacred Deer. Um, it's very interesting indeed. Very good, I thought. So, yeah, just a bit of context. So um, Yorgos Lanthimos is kind of the um, most prominent figure of this kind of Recently, uh, this mo- movement that's been going on in a few is called the Greek New Wave, or it's called the Weird Wave, because as you will see, these movies are quite eerie and weird. weird. And so, um, just for information, you might have heard of it, the, the first of his film was called Dark Tooth, which is a film we actually saw in our cause, yeah. and that was really kind of disturbing and... Unsettling, um, Unsettling, about this kind of family that's been locking up, uh, this family that's been locking off, um, there were two daughters and boy that were now kind of grown adults. adults but acting as child because they're yeah, the sickest yeah, child, shape yeah. and more recently he made kind of a movie he had wide appeal called uh, The Lobster With Colin Farrell um, exactly who comes back in this one then yeah sure so they've obviously got a, a, a good rapport the two of them um, uh, director actor <laughs> relationship but no yeah it's, it's um, no the film is beautifully crafted um, and it's got that that y- Yorgos Lanthimos touch where it's completely his own style um I'm not sure. What do you think makes up that style? There's a, there's a, there's a style of acting, there's a, a type of dialogue, and there's a colour palette. Um, um, yeah, I, I definitely feel the most kind of 
recogniz- recognizable touch of Yugo Santi in my films, and again for you guys who've seen the lobs, you kind of recognize it immediately going into the film. It's kind of that style of dialogue and that style of acting, which is actually really hard to describe. But we were saying it's kind of weird because they're almost the way the way it's performed is kind of inhuman. Um, because they show little emotion, yet there still is some sort of emotional resonance with the characters. Um, there still is that humanity where they, the, the, the family members do uh, love each other. Um, we should quickly summarise what the film's about, maybe. Yeah, no, yeah, of course. So, um, basically, to not spoil you really anything, this is about kind of a, a surgeon, um, so Colin Farrell, a father figure, a surgeon, who kind of... Um, has what would seem to be kind of the perfect American life. So he's working in an expensive hotel. Nuclear family type thing. Has a perfect suburban house. Um, but had this kind of, from the beginning, this real kind of dynamic with this teenager. Yeah, a which, strange relationship with a child, with a, like a 15-year-old maybe? Uh, yeah, 15, which actually I would, uh, we'll, we'll put the name of him on the corner because that actor was really amazing in the film. So He's going to be a star. Yeah, <laughs> He actually is. Um, <laughs> so basically, yeah, so perfect suburban life. Um, has this weird relationship with this kid. And suddenly, um, something happened with this kid um, right, so that what? affects uh, Colin Farrell's own children. Something so, drastic. Yeah, something actually, like, really heavy. And from there, Colin Farrell is faced with a terrible decision, which we don't want to spoil you because that's a lot of the interest. But the film. climax is one of the best climaxes of a movie me and Alex have seen in forever, so... Yeah, it has this. Thi- well, we don't. Yeah, we don't yeah, want to tell you too much. But the film starts off sort of as I mean, in, the, in his style, as a lot of his films do, slightly mundane. Um, and neither of us knew anything about the film going in, which was a good decision. But it starts off really, really mundane, and then he starts sort of uh, curious about these characters and what what their relationships are. Why he's got this relationship with this kid, and then the film does slowly, slowly. It's crescendo, the right mm. word. Yeah, crescendos, and it's this mad, it's just this really well-built, sort of subtly eases you in, but takes you to quite a, a, cl- a, a big climax. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, I, I think one of, the, um, one, of the, one of the impressive things with, and that kind of effective things with his style of talking, it's almost like, it's really like mechanical. It's almost as if the characters were always kind of forced to talk this way. And they're kind of repeating things yeah, that they've yeah. interiorized. And uh, uh, sure. like in this film, as you'll see, a lot of Lanthimos's previous film, The Lobster, and his first one, Dark Tooth, kind of really kind of touch about social conditioning and the kind of limits of free will in the society and how much how, how much of our lives is actually our own choice and not determined by all kinds of constraints and indoctrination, etc. And I feel the the his way, the way of speaking kind of really. Th- kind of indicates that where the characters almost you can feel that they were ho- not robots behind that there's something they're kind of there's, 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 there's still emotion between that but they're talking in a way that always kind of they, they're always the, the way other people are explaining that or expecting them and it's kind of the, the world where Killing of a Sacred Deal is set up is always this this kind of world where the, you can't really show really emo- your emotion in the way you exchange yeah, it with other yeah, people yeah. it's very interesting fascinating and I think I don't know what you want to think about it, but obviously the film is very beautifully framed and very like clinically more so, I think, than well, his previous so, film. Yeah, yeah, beautifully framed, but very distinct style of frame. It's not, I'm not sure what I'd compare it to as, um, as an example at all. I mean, there's... <coughs> the, it's like you always says, it's, 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 it's like super wide angle, like fisheye lens almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It, it's, I think, um, I, I don't know if you've ever watched films from... Todd Haynes. Um, I watched one last year. Um, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Anyway. We were, um, Far From Heaven, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, a yeah, remake yeah, yeah, of yeah, Dog Lick yeah, Cirque, yeah. All of Heaven and Laws. But he, he had his most favourite, my favourite of his film is called Safe, and it's kind of very similar. Oh, to the set. one about the housewife. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Kind of set um, in kind of, yeah, similarly like suburban, suburban yeah. angst, etc. So there's kind of a similar way of kind of framing static shots yeah, yeah. and kind of that in, in a wide lens and having kind of um, a kind of a static, prolonged shot where we kind of see these characters interacting in a kind of eerily awkward way and see there's a lot of, th- of things that, in, in, you know, a lot of stuff behind, mm. a lot of stuff that's been that's muted and repressed. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, compared to Justice League, this is such a... Di- it's a very different <laughs> It's such a different experience. Um, and, um, yeah, obviously, maybe Justice League is sort of the one you go and watch if you're just... 
wanting to relax and maybe have a, a light entertainment. Um, but if you're looking for a jet, not it's not just um, an artistic film you're going to sit through and feel uh, sort of good about yourself at the end of. It genuinely is really entertaining film um, and it's so gripping. Uh, slightly violent if you're squeamish. It's. I mean, it's it's it's. <sighs> It's, it's more, in, I would say, emotionally violent. I mean, I can't wait. <laughs> what about... Well, you know, violence. <laughs> <laughs> that is disgusting. Okay, it, it has some physical violence, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say, like, that it's nothing you've never seen before. No, I don't well, think that yeah, would no, be checked. Not. I mean, except if you're extremely... I mean, it, and it wasn't painful. unnecessary. It works. The yeah. violence works for helping to create the world that he was, mm. he was trying to create. But on, on, I, I, for sure, like, um, I think there's a lot to get um, out of watching this movie, but you definitely have to know what you're getting into. Yeah. Um, you kind of, yeah, this is, this is not really something you want to go with a couple of mates, kind of, you know... Having had a few beers, thinking you're just gonna laugh your way through. I mean, it does still have a kind of slow, you know, slowish yeah, yeah, yeah. rhythm. It's really something you have to kind of get into and really prepare for an hour and a half to be kind of, um, kind of yeah, really immersed in a kind of yeah, very eerie think, and kind yeah. of disturbing experience. I think we both um, agree, worth it on that. Ah, uh, yeah, definitely worth it. Worth it. Um. Uh, um so. Um, do you want to wrap up? Um. Just before we wrap up, so. Um, maybe we could, um, I thought, recommend if you go and see Lanthimos and even maybe to get a bit of more co- um, experience watching these kind of Greek new wave films. Again, um, go see Dogtooth. It really helped me in this movie, uh, knowing, uh, having some context as Lanthimos as a director, helped me to understand what he was trying to do a bit more, maybe. Um, so if you see Dogtooth and the lobster beforehand, that'd be great. If not, you'll still enjoy it. Um, okay, and so um, to kind of complete that list, I would have maybe um, two films to kind of see in that Greek wave, which are not... Okay, so the first one I would say is Attenberg, which is kind of the, the other big film with Dark Two, so his first feature, that kind of rose to a kind of international um, prominence, which is kind of about a relation between... the relationship between this girl and her father. That's kind of, again, really strange, really kind of um, theatrical and focuses a lot about um, kind of the body and how these actors kind of act in a really kind of performative, kind of awkward way. And the second film, which I actually saw yesterday evening, that's quite different from Lanthimos's Moss's film. Um, I can't remember. I think the, the director's name is Papamandopoulos. I'll, I'll, I'll put the name on the corner. It's one of those, no offense if you're Greek, but <laughs> one of those hard, uh, Greek names that's quite hard to pronounce, um, which is called Suntan, literally the English word for Suntan. And is um, like a lot of these films, um, kind of focused on youth, and is about kind of this both really kind of delightful, but at the same time kind of really mel- melancholic tale of this doctor, um, forty years old doctor who kind of have a, a mid mid age crisis um, at the middle of his life, and goes onto this party islands where he's surrounded about kind of beautiful youths, really you know the dream Ibiza life, and kind of yeah having wanting to include himself to kind of relive his past youth, but kind of coming to terms that he, he can't really do that anymore. So, yeah, I would say the top three. So, Dark Tooth by Yorgos Lanthimos, um, Attenberg by Saganari, I think she's called, we put all the names on the video, and um, Santan by Papa, I can't remember how to pronounce it yet. So, and just yeah. uh, one final thing before we end. Uh, I think just, just a one-word answer or two words, depending on how long the film title is. What's your uh, most underrated superhero? What do you think the most underrated superhero is? Oh, yeah, we, we is? forgot about that part. <laughs> um, um, okay, I, I would Quick say... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say... Um, it, it's not, okay, it's, it, it, it's not the a kind of a, a straightforward superhero film, but I would say if I had to work on one that's kind of underrated and that's a bit forgotten since it's kind of surge of more than these superheroes, it's Chronicle... By um, he's the same, and this should be a reference because that was a complete mess up. The same director who made um, Fantastic Four, the yeah, latest no, Fantastic saying, Four, yeah, yeah, with yeah. um, and so yeah, the newest Cro- Fantastic, yeah, 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 yeah. But th- this was a mess. But Chronicle is really a great films about kind of these these teenagers who who suddenly buy some kind of you know day day sex mark and ask their bed to write films. So they get their superpowers, but the film is very much about kind of. How, how do these kind of um, 
on you know te teen teens who are kind of coming to grip with life and are not in the best place in their lives kind of react having suddenly so much control and power okay and that it, it, well, it, i haven't seen yeah. it so that'll be on the yeah list. you should I'm definitely watch it, it. definitely um and i was gonna say i think the most underrated superhero movie is x-men 3 I'm a massive fan of the X Men <laughs> universe. Well, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Everyone hates it with the uh, the whole finale um, and everything being over the top and sort of wishy washy. But it still holds the themes that I love about X Men, which is the Martin Luther King versus Malcolm X parallels. Mm. Um, it was still and sort of that the victimisation of the mutants. It still had all those themes, and throughout the movie, it carried them well. Yeah, X Men Three. Yeah. So I think uh, that's all for uh, for us guys. Um, so, um, I guess you could give us suggestions for yeah, uh, what do. to talk about next. We kept cutting today, it's the first time, so we're yeah. just sort of playing with the Thank ideas. Thank you for your comprehension, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.